Hi, everyone. Can your grandfather's diet shorten your life? What does that even mean? Well, it turns out it's possible. And I remember when we stumbled upon this topic in June of 2010. Really, really fascinating stuff for me. And uh, it turns out it's true. Uh, there is actually, well, how about this? I'm not going to ruin it. Just give it a listen, everyone. Can your grandfather's diet shorten your life? Welcome to Stuff You Should Know from HowStuffWorks.com. Hey, and welcome to the podcast. I'm Josh Clark. There's Charles W. Chuck Bryant. And I'm Charles W. Chuck Bryant. And I'm Josh Clark. And that makes this Stuff You Should Know, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I hope so. This is our podcast. We've been doing it for a while. And... Um, Are you welcoming new listeners? Yeah, here's another one. <laughs> okay. All right. And actually, I'm pretty excited about this one. I've been wanting to do this one for a while. You've been bugging me. Epigenetics, Chuck. It's the, Let's it's, do it. Let's do it. The cutting edge of research, of human, of, of our understanding of life. Not yes. just human, of all life. My mind was blown. It's a pretty big deal. Yeah, real big deal. So, Chuck, you've heard of the uh, genetic revolution. Charles Darwin, he had a long beard. He yeah. He loved sea turtles, that sure. kind of thing. He used to vacation in the Galapagos, right? Uh-huh. He... Um, Wrote on the origin of the species, and uh, it was a pretty groundbreaking book. I would say so. It was basically what he came up with was we are driven by our genes, right? Mm-hmm. We have genetic code and our DNA, and that makes us redheaded. It makes us timid. It yeah. makes us courageous. Prone it, to cancer. It, right, exactly. And uh, it makes us thick-tongued. Right? Sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> and we are slaves to these genes, right? Uh-huh. There's nothing we can do to alter them. We get them from our parents. Yeah. But, you know, if if we find out that over time uh, being thick-tongued is, um, say, advantageous to human survival, right. we're all going to talk like me. But millions of years from now. Yeah. At least hundreds yeah. of thousands. Makes for good podcasting. It, it definitely <laughs> does. And I just look for it in the future. Yes. Okay. When we're all running around with robot bodies. Right. Um. There was another guy, and actually Darwin, just to show off once, came across a uh, a type of orchid, right? Uh, the moon orchid, I believe is what it's called. Okay. And it had a very, very deep, um, I guess, pistil? Pistil or stamen. I, I can never keep those things <laughs> apart. Uh, and the nectar was down in there. And he looked at that flower and said, you know what? There is an organism out there, probably a flying organism, that... It has a proboscis that fits perfectly into that flower. Was it the hummingbird? It was a um, hawk moth. Ugh. And sure enough, a few a few years later, some point in time later, they discovered the hawk moth, and it was pretty much literally made to fit, right? Wow. But there's another guy named Jean-Baptiste Lamarck, who I know you've heard of as well, right? All, and all his Lamarckian stuff? Right. He, yeah. was, he was about... 60 to 80 he was working about 60 or so years before darwin right he had his own ideas based on giraffes right yes he said that giraffes necks grew uh to reach the food but it was just over the course of a few generations right right and that's kind of flies in the face of darwin yeah sure who said it takes hundreds of thousands of years with this stuff called epigenetics that we're about to talk about today suddenly people are starting to go back and look at lamarck who uh was kind of dismissed as a quack yeah um, and say, you know what? Lamarck may have been right in this one. Yeah. Prepare for your minds to be melted let's, is all I have to say. Let's talk about epigenetics, Chuck. Okay. And go. <laughs> <laughs> Josh, let's first talk about the genome. Right. I, I heard a computer reference analogy that I thought was, was pretty spot on. Mm-hmm. If you think of uh, the genome as computer hardware, mm-hmm. then the epigenome would be the software right. that tells the computer what to do and when to do it. But in this case, the epigenome tells your cells what to do, what kind of cells to be, when to activate or deactivate. Mm-hmm. So, like, I guess every cell or, uh, yeah, the DNA in every cell in the human body ha- is, has the exact same DNA. Yes. You have, like, half of your mother's and half of your father's, and it comes together and gives you your DNA, right? Right. Um, and if you look at the DNA in every cell from a... Uh, uh, the kind of cell that makes up your fingernail, what would that be, a keratinocyte? Sure. Okay, to a um, sperm cell, right? right? Very, very specialized type of cell. Yeah. They all have the same DNA. Uh-huh. They have the same genes in there. Um, but what makes them different and what makes uh, a keratinocyte and a sperm cell, those things, mm-hmm. are the, the 
tags yeah. on those genes. So some are turned off, some are turned on. And right. in a specific combination, you have either a keratinocyte or a sperm cell or a neuron or um, a cell that makes up your eyeball. Right. All of that stuff. Yeah. So it's essentially, it's a chemical tag that literally changes the physical structure of your genome. Right. So it'll bind uh, tightly, let's say, to an inactive uh, gene and make it unreadable, or it'll stretch out an active gene and make it really accessible. Right. Physically changing it. And epigenetics means above the genome because these tags, these they're called methyl tags, right. which is what one hydrogen and two carbon? Uh, carbon and hydrogen bundles, yeah. Okay. So it's That's a, a really, methyl group, yeah. It, it's a really simple um, compound. Uh-huh. Um, but they they uh, they attach to the gene at right. a place where other proteins or enzymes normally would attach to activate it. Yeah. So basically, what they do is block a gene from being activated, and they can silence them. Yeah. So it's like a light switch. Literally, you can turn off some genes and turn off others. Right. Um, and the uh, the honeybee actually is is a pretty good demonstration of this. Did you read about honeybees? No. Okay. So you've got a worker bee, right? Uh-huh. Which is a sterile, kind of mindless, dumb bee that just does what it's supposed to do. No offense to any worker bees out there. Right. Agreed. Hey, I'm all down with May Day. Yeah. All right. <laughs> uh, and uh, with um, a queen bee, you have this, uh, first of all, she can reproduce. Uh-huh. She goes and kills other rival queens. Right. She does um, kind of all sorts of other stuff that a worker bee isn't capable of doing. Uh-huh. Um, and what they found was a queen bee, queen bee larvae are raised in this royal jelly, right? Right. Which uh, worker bees secrete from their, their heads. Uh-huh. It's this nutrient rich jelly. So the larva mm. grows in it. And what they found, yeah, I know. Sounds kind of good, doesn't it? It does. Uh, just because of the jelly part. <laughs> yeah, of course. What they found was that, um, the royal jelly has, a, it adds a methyl tag to the queen bee larvae's DNMT3 gene. Okay. And this gene is like literally the on-off switch. If this gene is on, it goes to the default worker bee, right? Right. If it's off, then all the genes that that make a, a queen bee a queen bee are able to be turned on. Crazy. Isn't it? Yeah. So epigenetics happens in bees as well. Yeah. And mice. Yes. The uh, They've done a lot of studies with mice, obviously, in the agouti gene in these mice. Mm-hmm. And they would uh, they experiment with um, with these mice affecting basically turning on and off the epigenetic switch. So an unmethylated uh, gene would affect the the mouse's size and weight, and then right. co- and then coat color. Right. It makes them real fat and like yellow. Yeah, instead it's of skinny horrid. and brown. Have you seen one of these things? Yeah, they're huge. Yeah, they should all be named Wilbur. <laughs> Uh, the cool thing is, though, they, they showed the difference between the skinny brown one and the fat yellow one. But then they also um, did experiments where they did half and half, mm-hmm. like turned on half of them and turned off half of them. Mm-hmm. And they literally showed them in a sequence. I don't know if you saw this picture, but they went from fat yellow to mm-hmm. skinny brown. And in between, they got thinner and with spotted coats along the way. Crazy. Like yellow and brown spotted coats? Yeah. Weird. It's that specific. Yeah, and the one of the ways that they have found that they can manipulate these, uh, what is it, agouti? Yeah, the agouti. The agouti gene mm-hmm. in these mice that I guess are bred specifically for this gene to be easily observed or something. Yeah, manipulated too. Um, is through diet. Right. So they've actually taken agouti gene mice mothers who are pregnant, fed them a bunch of um, – B vitamins in their diet. Yeah, and soy, right? Yeah, soy is a really easy uh, easy grab for B vitamins, I right. believe, right? Um, fed these these pregnant, big, fat, yellow, ugly mice B vitamins, and their kids came out that that healthy, skinny, brown, uh-huh. right? Um, they had identical moms with the same, like, a goody gene, same upbringing, same everything. Right. Just fed them the normal mouse diet without vitamin B, and they had the big, fat, yellow kids. Right. So uh, diet is a really big factor in epigenetic changes. What Chuck and I are talking about right now is that science has found evidence that you can change the genetics of your children 
by eating B vitamins or by being abused when you're pregnant. Well, see, that's what gets me. Some of the, the, the diet like makes a little bit of sense, but the fact that an environmental stimulus placed on your mom or even your grandparents mm-hmm. can affect your children or grandchildren, something you didn't even experience at all. Right. It's kind of unfair. And actually, I have to tell you, the more I study this, uh-huh. the more worried I am for my own child or children. Yeah. Like, really, it, uh, yeah. what they're finding is the decisions that you make, uh-huh. especially at a youngish age, right. are going to affect several generations because these the you what you're doing is adding methyl tags. What we're talking about is pretty much the definitive answer to the nature and nurture debate. And what we're finding is both. You have right. nature, which is your genes, uh-huh. and they're very much active, but you have uh, nurture, which is the environment, whether it's diet, whether it's stress, um, whether it's lack of exercise, uh-huh. your body responds to these changes by saying, okay, all right, well, then we need to, if, if you're going to lay around and be fat, then we have to we have to deactivate this gene. We will punish your grandkids. And your grandkids who are trying to be normal are right. going to be fat little kids that have, live, you know, shortened lives. Right. And this is where it came from, right, Chuck? Wasn't there, a, there was a study in Sweden that uh, kind of broke this ground. Yeah, didn't they find that um, it was a very isolated group of people in Sweden? Mm-hmm. And at, at the time, they were very isolated, at least, where they couldn't get help from the outside world right. very very readily. And I think they studied the, the famine. Isn't that right? Well, they, they How the famine affected the generations afterward. Well, they had like feast or famine. It was like an agricultural town. And they looked at these agricultural records that this town kept for some reason, like really detailed records for d- throughout the 19th century. And some years there was nothing and people starved to death. The next year there was everything. And they found that the grandparents, the grandfathers um, who – feasted and starved within a year of one another. Right. Um, their grandkids lived an average of 32 years shorter or less right. than it's the same the grandkids of the same people who didn't have that kind of feast or famine experience. Right. In the same town. Right. Around the, with the same socioeconomic conditions. Yeah. So, yeah, that's three generations right there, right? Yeah. Did you hear about the Angelman syndrome and the Pradavati syndrome? No, don't lean on me. The, they, uh, I saw. The, actually, it was a PBS documentary. The uh, it's called "The Ghost in Your Genes." Did you watch that? Uh-uh. Oh, dude, it's on YouTube. It's in five, I think five or six sections of ten minutes a piece. It's mm-hmm. a full show. Mm-hmm. Mind blowing. Uh, they found that there's there's these two different sy- uh, syndromes, and I won't get too deep into what they are, but Angelman syndrome. And uh, Pradavili syndrome is what it's called. And they it, found... That sounds Italian. <laughs> it's uh, Pradavili. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> I dropped the ball there. Uh, basically, what causes each of these is a missing piece of DNA, and it can cause two different disease. Well, they found it can cause two, these two different diseases that are completely unrelated, depending on which parent it came from. Really? Which missing uh, uh, part of the gene it came from. So basically... Uh, it's as if the gene knew where it was coming from, like gene imprinting. The gene had a memory that, oh, it came from the father, so you're going to have Angelman syndrome, or it came from the mother, so you're going to have Prodavilli. Right, and this is a relatively recent discovery. We were yeah. talking about them looking at agricultural records of the uh, 19th century in Sweden. That was a doctor named uh, Dr. Lars Olav Bygren, but he was working in the mid-'80s. And he didn't really start to lay the foundation of epigenetic research until the mid to late 90s. So this is a very right. new field. But what they're finding and what Chuck was just saying is that your parents can pass on these epigenetic changes that happen within themselves, right? Right. Um, and your grandparents can too. Right. But this isn't supposed to happen. What happens when an egg and a sperm meet, uh-huh. right? And it's like, hey, here's half of, here's my DNA, here's my DNA. Right. You know, and they get together. Um, there is actually a process where these specialized cells go through and basically clean the DNA uh-huh. of methyl tags. Right. But they found that not all methyl tags get cleaned off. Yeah. So diet can affect certain genes these methyl tags can be passed down um and and with abuse as well uh, have you heard about ptsd 
yeah, being well, passed down. Yeah, they covered that in the um, in that special as well. They did a test with uh, pregnant women who were in New York at the time of nine eleven. Mm-hmm. Did you hear about this one? Yeah, this is a really recent study, right? Yeah, and they basically found that pregnant women that experienced that were pregnant at the time the towers came down, right, and experienced post traumatic stress disorder. Mm-hmm. They found that their babies had lower levels of cortisol, just like their moms did, which helps you deal with uh, stress, helps you how you deal with stress. Right. So these little babies inherited, basically inherited post-traumatic stress disorder right. from their mothers in right. the womb, in utero. And um, cortisol, it's a hormone, and it would be produced by a gene or expressed by a gene. Right. And how much or how little is expressed depends on whether that gene is silenced, whether it's altered, and that alteration comes from methyl tags, which Crazy. can be passed down. So PTSD can be passed down, right? Yeah, and they're, what they're speculating now that, and this is obviously speculation because these kids are still young, but they're speculating that it's going to happen to their kids as well, and that's going to be the real, like, gold nugget. Right. They're, they're, it, they do go away eventually, they think. Oh, Methyl really? tags. Well, they have in, like, fruit flies. With fruit flies, it's like 400 generations, but fruit flies have a generation every, like, five minutes, you know? Right. <laughs> um, and then I think with uh, mice, it's like 40 generations or something like that. Um, and with humans, they expect it to be somewhere around three, maybe a few more. Oh, really? And then, yeah, because what's happening is our bodies are responding to environmental cues right. to change. And then after those environmental cues go away, the mm-hmm. body's like, oh, okay, well, we can go back to normal now right. and get rid of this methyl tag. So we've got nutrition. Right. You are what you you are what you eat. You are what your parents ate. You are what your grandparents ate. Uh, and then there's um, things like stress. Yeah, which well, parenting. Right. And yeah, I think they found with mice, mice, uh, mothers that didn't nurture their kids um, or nurse their kids. Right. Uh, ra- raise kids, produce kids that were kind of jumpy and um, I guess had the mice version of PTSD. And they theorized that the, the, body had undergone an epigenetic change to prepare these mice for a stressful a, a life. Very stressful life yeah. where they need to be on guard, you right. know? Exactly. Which if you think about it, Chuck, I wrote a blog post about this. It's possible what we call PTSD is an epigenetic change that says you live in an environment where you can't just you can't relax. Right. So we're gonna make you jumpy. You're gonna be edgy and you're going to have flashbacks so that you're always, you know, on point. And it it's the result of an epigenetic change from a stressful event yeah and the same i think you mentioned abuse earlier they found that one out of every five suicide victims uh was a victim of child abuse as well yeah so they're still kind of theorizing now but they think there's a positive correlation there between like you said stressful upbringing and and epigenetic change right so what else uh well do i mean are we gonna talk about the good what could be good about this potentially yes because it could be really good we're talking about and it's still early going. We're talking about potentially curing things like Alzheimer's, yeah, cancer, um, mental disorders, yeah. uh, multiple sclerosis, you Thick name it. Thick-tongueness. Thick-tongueness. Yeah. Potentially being able to cure this because you can't – they found that it's really hard to fix like uh, a, a cancer cell. And so what the doctors are thinking now is it, it's really hard to, to fix – a cancer cell, but it's a whole lot easier to turn these epigenetic switches on and off, which may in turn help defeat cancer. Right. Like you want to get a tumor suppressing gene going. Yeah. And then, but you want to get a uh, cellular growth gene turned down a little bit. Right. Like that and that you just cured cancer. Yeah. This, this one doctor put it like this. He said that, um, it's almost like a diplomacy instead of a war. Like you'll go tell the cell, Hey, you're a good human cell. You don't need to behave this way. You should not be behaving this way. Yes, uh, it's called uh, azacitidine. Looks good to me. <laughs> azacitidine. It was originally marketed for um, something else entirely. Probably Alzheimer's. Everything was, uh, and then they come up with. Uh, they figure out that it's actually um, turning down these uh, growth cells or these growth genes, and they say. Hey, how about we use this for leukemia? Right. Bada boom, bada bing. There you go. Yeah, people are all of a sudden in remission uh, where they hadn't been before. Right. So it's pretty pretty startling. Yeah. It's still in the early stages, though. Right. Uh, the other thing too is you can you can 
it's it's easier to fix the epigenome. That's the good news as we move forward. It's also a lot easier to mess up your own epigenome right by diet and smoking and things like that. Yeah, the, there was a um, the guy who was studying Sweden hooked up with a guy who proposed. Uh, the entire field of epigenetics in 1996. And then they got together with another uh, researcher who was running that. You remember the uh, Framing, Framingham-ton? Farmington. Is it Farmingham? Farmingham? Framingham. Framingham. <laughs> that, the Massachusetts study, the heart study? Yeah, that's like remember, 40 years long or something. Right. Remember uh, Great Britain's version of it? It's like the Avon longitudinal study? Yeah. Okay. So this guy had a friend who had access to these these files, and what they found was that 166 fathers in this study started smoking around age 11, uh, and so they started looking at these these guys and found that their kids were shorter and fatter and just generally unhealthier than other kids, even controlling for other factors as well. Wow. So smoking's a problem. Drugs are a problem. Cocaine-addicted sure. mice uh, pass memory problems on to three generations of their offspring, yeah, it said that uh, cocaine especially tri- uh, triggers epigenetic changes that affect like hundreds of genes at the same time. Yeah, so, Which is because memory is just such a complex process. Yeah. So don't do cocaine. No, <laughs> and don't smoke. It's just a bad idea, especially at a young age. And, Chuck, there's a uh, project underway. You don't remember the Human Genome Project completed in March of 2000. Yeah, which is now that they're kind of like... Pfft. Exactly. There was a. Did you read this Time article? Nah. Uh, at the end of it, the the author is talking about the epigenome project. That's the big daddy, right? And he was saying that the human epigenome project is going to make the human genome project look like the homework that 16th century school kids did on their abacuses. <laughs> so think about this. Uh, what they found in the human genome project is twenty seven thousand genes that were mapped. Right. Right. Um, just just fiddling with these combinations increases the the map that needs to be created exponentially right, right? like domino's pizza has 27 ingredients that do they produces really? they do i went and counted <laughs> the, it produces 88 million different combinations from 27 wow. now imagine 27,000 ingredients how many different combinations yeah. does that produce sure. this is the scope of the human epigenome project that's underway now wow what what about Pizza Hut with all their like stuffed crust and eat it backwards and the ingredients are underneath your pizza and probably even more <laughs> stuff. Yeah, but I think Domino's has more pizza because they've got like the Philly cheesesteak one and they have like the right. ch- cheeseburger, the bacon cheeseburger. <laughs> they which just put is a sandwich. Really good. Yeah, they do like the Reuben sandwich pizza. That would be very good. That too. would be good. Yeah. So epigenetics is changing everything. I think at its core, it's going to. It's going to point out that all of our understanding of medicine is just an an odd way of describing an epigenetic change. Yeah. You know, like psychology, psychiatry. Yeah. I I predict that our future and complete understanding of humanity is going to be a combination of sociology and epigenetics. So we we thought we were onto something with mirror neurons, but forget what we said. (laughs) Not just kidding, actually. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I think that you could probably explain that epigenetically yeah. and with sociology as well. Have you heard of this guy, Dr. Bruce Lipton? N- no. He is, uh, he's got a documentary out called The Living Matrix. And at first I was reading him, I was like, wow, this guy's really onto something. But then I started reading other people saying, this guy's a quack. Oh, yeah? Yeah, he basically, he's a big epigenetics guy, but he thinks that your brain can essentially change your genetic expression by manipulating the epigenome. Like just concentrating? He thinks the placebo effect could potentially be explained by this and like uh, spontaneous remission uh-huh. and cancer. Spontaneous combustion. <laughs> spontaneous remission, obviously, is when you go into remission with no known cause. Right. Not from, t- you know, any treatment. Right. And he says this is explained because you're, you have a profound change in your perception uh, of your life and what life is all about, and that can potentially alter the epigenome. Well, you could also make a case that this guy, what this guy is talking about is decreasing stress, which stress just wreaks havoc on us. Yeah, good point. Uh, and could create methyl tags and alter gene expression. So maybe he's just using a quacky 
way of describing right. lowering your own stress levels yeah. by increasing self-confidence. Yeah, it's interesting when you see these people, though, and you watch a YouTube video and you think, wow, my gosh, that's the secret to the future. Right. And then you see all these other people that go, that guy is such a quack. Yeah, but at the same time, you could you could say, well, maybe those other people are unimaginative. Yeah, good yeah. point. So if you want to learn more about epigenetics, I strongly recommend University of Utah's website. It um, Have you been on it, Chuck? Yeah, why didn't you recommend that to me? Is, did, <laughs> did you see it? I don't think so. I did. I oh, this is like a month ago yes. when we... Uh... Yeah, you can turn up gene expression, <laughs> turn it down. There's yeah. like um, a lot of foods that you should eat if you want to alter yourself epigenetically, especially right. if you're pregnant. Or go to YouTube and watch The Ghost in Your Genes from right. PBS. It is literally mind-blowing. Well, not literally. People always say literally. <laughs> yeah. It's figuratively you mind-blowing. Your just explodes. <laughs> Talk about changing your genetic expression and... If you want to read some very beautiful prose on epigenetics, uh, chock full of flight simulator references, read uh, How Epigenetics Works by typing epigenetics in the handy search bar at HowStuffWorks.com, which means it's time for listener mail. Yes, indeed, Josh. Josh, you remember Sarah, the amazing 11-year-old fan? She's not 11 anymore. Who captured our hearts. When she first emailed early on in the days of podcasting? Yes, I do. Like, she was one of the first fans, actually. Yeah. Sarah, the amazing 11-year-old fan, is now Sarah, the amazing 13-year-old fan. Gosh. I know. I feel so old now. We We've should, been doing this a while. Well, yeah, and we should keep, like, once a year, we should update people on Sarah's age. And then when she graduates, if we're still doing this in five years, mm-hmm. when she graduates college, we should go, like, uh, or uh, high school. Yeah. We should go to her graduation or something. We should give the commencement speech. We should. I, I call valedictorian. Well, yeah, and the, the principal would be like, who are you guys? Yeah. Can we get security in here? <laughs> we'll say, I'm the valedictorian. He's the salutatorian. What do you mean? <laughs> uh, so this comes from Sarah. She checks in with us from time to time, and she's still just as cute at 13. She's not all bratty now that she's a teenager. Hello to some of my favorite people. Today I earned some strange looks from people about my knowledge of Legos or Lego bricks. I also tried making a sphere of Lego, but I couldn't figure it out. Also, today's my birthday. I'm really excited that I'm finally a teen. Yahoo! You remember what I asked for? And what she asked for, she's got a uh, blog now. And she asked if one of us could comment on her blog. And I went to her blog and commented. And her blog is basically her and her little friend talking back and forth to each other about oh, stuff. How cute. Do they dot their eyes with hearts? No, well, I don't think you can do that. But it is really, really cute. And um, I'm actually going to encourage people to go to her blog. I hope she gets mad traffic. And her blog, Josh, is Sarah Loves Australian Commercials.webs.com. And here's the clincher it is S A S A R A H. There's no WWW, right? No. Okay. And uh, she misspells Australian all over the place. All over which her blog. Which makes it even cuter. Um, she spells it A U S T R A I L I A N. So it's like Aus. Trail, I N, A I A N. Right. So spell the whole URL. <laughs> uh, HTTP colon slash slash S A R A H L O V E S A U S T R A I L I A N C O M M E R C I A L S dot webs W E B S dot com. And I hope people go by there and check it out. I hope so, too. Um, so she turned 13. She says, by the way, can you please not tell Kristen, Molly, or Katie that I think you guys are better than them? I think that would be kind of like bragging. It would be kind of so, like bragging, which is why we would never do it. We would never tell them, and they I'm sure they don't listen to our show, so they'll never know. <laughs> and then she closes, and this is Emily just thought this was the cutest thing ever. Well, so long, farewell, our Alviter saying goodbye, adieu, adieu to you and you and you. <laughs> and then in parentheses, she says, in case you didn't know, that was from The Sound of Music. Yeah. So long, farewell. Yeah. Yeah. Alviter and saying that's goodbye. one of Emily's favorite. Uh, well, you should sing the rest of it, too. Adieu, adieu to you and you and you. <laughs> 
So, Sarah, happy birthday. You're awesome. You're a dedicated fan. Clearly she is. We just think you're super cool. And good luck with the blog. If you do learn how to dot eyes with heart, we want to know, Sarah. Happy birthday to you. If you uh, want to become a fan who's captured our hearts, send us something interesting. We want to. Uh, we want another super fan. And be a cute little kid. Otherwise, you're not going to capture That hearts. helps as well. Broken yeah. English doesn't hurt, too. True. Uh, you can send it an email to stuffpodcast at howstuffworks.com. For more on this and thousands of other topics, visit howstuffworks.com. Want more How Stuff Works? Check out our blogs on the howstuffworks.com homepage. <laughs>